Hello, welcome to episode 31 of the Notcast. Today, uh, I'm going to be talking at you for probably about 40 minutes about a U2 album called The Unforgettable Fire, uh, which was released in late 1984. Um, oh, suddenly I realised this is an original vinyl copy, by the way, of The Unforgettable Fire album, and at some point over the last 36 years, the glue that's used in the sleeve um, has dried. And actually what you'll see is the colour bar and check that they've got inside there. Uh, most of the time you don't normally see that, but that's a little peek behind the curtain into how they make records and printing. So, um, U2's Unforgettable Fire, uh, released in 1985, their fourth album. Uh, now here's some words which I think we're going to go and uh, try and ban from using, but I'm going to inevitably fail. Uh, atmospheric, ambient, suggestive, atmosphere. Um, you know, all those type of things, intangible, moody, uh, those are all the things that uh, The Unforgettable Fire is. Um, there's also a couple of other words about it, um, probably not that nice depending if you're not a U2 fan. Um, but uh, the whole the whole process I think starts off with, uh, with uh, no it doesn't actually, I've got it totally wrong. I'm going to have to come back to Clarence in a lifetime later on. I thought this came in between uh, War and The Unforgettable Fire. I think it comes after The Unforgettable Fire now, according to the copyright notice that's on there. So um, U2's Unforgettable Fire album, released in 1984, was their fourth album. And I think it was the first time that the band moved from releasing albums that were a collection of songs into an album that was a thematically whole work of art where the songs were very well sequenced next to each other and worked well together um but of course you wouldn't necessarily have known that had you bought the first single because the first single from the album still played live to this day is pride in the name of love and this is a classic stadium rock anthem as i said in a previous episode uh, new year's day weren't sunday bloody sunday were the type of songs where if you write three songs like that during the course of your career you're going to have a career. Pride is, you know, another one of those classics. It is up there with uh, Paradise City as a classic rock song that's probably played on classic rock FM, possibly even being played now. And I wouldn't be surprised if, like Dark Side of the Moon, somebody somewhere in the world is listening to a copy of this song right now. And if it isn't, probably not working. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of, of background history. Um, in this book, The Unforgettable Fire, uh, by uh, Eamon Dunphy, which is regarded by some people uh, as a load of bollocks, is what I have heard it described as. Uh, it states that the band's financial position changed significantly around about the time that this this album was, was recorded. Um, and so the, um, the band signed a deal with Island Records, uh, which provided them with, according to this book, £2 million per album delivered, sight on scene, and the label had no, no choice or influence over, over that. They couldn't reject the album. Uh, that the band's royalties doubled, with with the release of this album and the band got their publishing rights back which meant that for every time that somebody covered a U2 song U2 were paid for it instead of Island Records uh, very economically advantageous effectively at this point the band became financially secure for the rest of their lives um, obviously there's degrees of uh, of prudency around that uh, but effectively um, it was uh, a job they didn't have to do it was a job that they were doing because they liked doing it at this point and clearly you don't go into a rock band um, because you want a job you go into a rock band because you don't want to get a job that's how rock works apparently it's why I was in a band albeit briefly and it didn't quite work um, also at this time you know the band built an infrastructure around them of people that worked in their office people that worked at their sound crew you know they became a, uh, they were already a small business at this point um, and when they'd finished recording the Unforgettable Fire album, um, they were already back on the road straight away. So recording of the album took place at Windmill Lane Studios in Slane Castle in Ireland and another studio, the name of which I temporarily forget because I haven't looked it up in advance. Um, there is a, a video of the Unforgettable Fire period which has a 25 minute documentary around the making of the album. Uh, that's also on the uh, U2 Go Home DVD and it's also available on the DVD in this 2009 box set reissue version of The Unforgettable Fire. Now, starting off with it, um, Pride was 
and still is, you know. Um, U2's intention was to create a number one single with that, and I think it got to, I think, number three in the UK, but it didn't even get into the top ten in the US. Um, but they really thought it was, you know, their big killer hook, and so they weren't ashamed at all to, uh, putting it technically, format the heck out of the album. So, Pride came released in a number of formats. Uh, first and foremost, it came as a seven-inch single. Um, it came as both a seven-inch and a gatefold double seven-inch single, which contained uh, this picture of them. It looks like it's on the water. Um, that might that looks like it's actually in Rome, um, and it has uh, two seven-inch singles, which contain "Pride in the Name of Love" and the Fourth of July. And on the other single, uh, "Boomerang." one and two now boomerang one is an instrumental boomerang two is a vocal although the vocals on on boomerang are um anorexic to put it nicely um they're two different recordings of the same song two different arrangements because i've played them simultaneously i've done an a b test and i've played you know the boomerang one and boomerang two at the same time they're different recordings they're different performances and i wondered actually could i create an extended mix of Boomerang 1 and 2 together and because they are different performances and different mixes um, it's very difficult to do that and it got to the point where I just gave up really and I figured no one's interested in a seven minute version of a U2B side anyway apart from me so I didn't do it so Pride heavily formatted single and uh, this was the first album and the first set of recordings that the band did away from Steve Lillywhite they'd felt that they'd been recording with Steve for uh, a long period of time they you know they made three albums with him and I think they they felt that they needed to add a little bit more mystery into the band uh, and that's why they brought Brian Eno along to be a member of the band as well um, but they really wanted Pride to be a hit so they released a lot of formats of Pride here's the 12 inch single uh, which again has uh, Boomerang 1 and 2 and 4th of July so nothing extra that's on on that um, although it kind of creates a break from the existing uh, types of, of sleeve that they've got. There's also in a second 12 inch, which features a previously unreleased version of 11 o'clock TikTok. Uh, now 11 o'clock TikTok was on the Under a Blood Red Sky album, so there was some demand for that track. Um, and uh, 11 o'clock TikTok was not on any previous album. Also, you'll notice it contains Touch. So we've got a five track 12 inch single of 11 o'clock and Touch on the B side here. And on the A side, we've got Pride and Boomerang 1 and 2. 4th of July isn't on this because 4th of July appears in a very slightly different mix on the album, The Unforgettable Fire itself. Um, we also moved into uh, another kind of thing. Now, in the 80s, what really, really mattered was chart positions. You, know, you didn't get streams, you didn't get airplay. In the UK, it was how many copies of a record you sold. And here is U2's first picture disc single of Pride, uh, which features, handily enough, a colour picture of uh, the four members of the band from the album sessions um, standing outside what appears to be Moy Drum Castle, and uh, on the B side, pictures of four millionaires. Well, maybe not millionaires at that point, but not far off it. Uh, definitely earning more then than I am now, I would say. Um, and that's not a necessarily a bad thing. Uh, obviously, really cornered the market with the staring moodily into the distance. There is an Instagram uh, account called uh, Bands Not Looking at the Camera. A uh, couple of shots in here would be ideal for bands not looking at the camera. Uh, they also plugged the hell out of Pride as a single. Uh, I think they shot three videos for it. They shot a performance video. Uh, they shot a black and white video. Um, they shot an extra one, which was set in a school hall. And they did some from the album sessions as well. And presumably one where they all just kind of wandered around Dublin a little bit, looked vaguely confused. Um, and then, you know, they, they prepped into the release of the album. Now, the tour for the album started before the album was released, six weeks before. So the first dates were in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but because the album hadn't come out. Um, they'd spent longer in the studio than perhaps they'd originally intended to. They played very few of the songs from the Unforgettable Fire album on the Australian and New Zealand shows. They slowly introduced them throughout the course of them. They tried arrangements, found out what did and didn't work. Um, and they found out that, uh, you know, they'd, they'd basically they'd spent too long recording things that were too complex that they couldn't play on stage. Um, there was some talk about, well, should they get a keyboard player? Should they add a horn section? 
um, which they chose not to do and chose they they chose to expand it through the use of sequencers um, through through edge now the album oh i'm really regretting not checking that it comes in an inner sleeve here uh, and what we do have actually for the first time is you know a more impressionistic picture of the band members than i think perhaps you'd have seen because we looked at the cover of october it's very straight it's very full on it's very clearly four blokes standing in front of a camera whereas especially on the cover of the of the, the unforgettable fire here you've only got two members of the band on the cover of this uh, and you've got you know four members on on the back photo and you've got four members on the inside sleeve but it's almost as if the members of you two are almost surplus to requirements that the album cover itself would stand up whether um the uh whether, whether they were in the photograph or not now the photograph was taken at a place called moydrum castle uh, it's not publicly accessible you can get pretty near to it but it's not publicly accessible um and uh it, it looks pretty much just the same so if you you want to google some pictures of the castle before the fire about 1885 or thereabouts it's pretty damn impressive it's now overgrown with moss um, and that's you know the album itself now the the album comes in a, a multitude of um configurations uh, but the, the you know the core 10 tracks on the album uh, remain the same and really it was putting out a very clear um you know middle ground between the the straightforward pointing at you telling you war is wrong from the war album to something that's far more impressionistic far more vague far more out of focus so the band were really working in in creating a texture creating a sound using the production of the album as a you know, a character in itself as opposed to just simply recording the songs what become important to them was also that they were recording the sounds of the songs um, and you know the songs really really they worked really very hard on making them now pride by the way is the second track on the album the uh, the 12 inch version is i think a minute longer on that and uh, as I kind of mentioned in a previous episode, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the label started pressing the 12-inch singles onto CD singles. So here is a CD single of Pride. This version comes from Austria and uh, has uh, Pride, Boomerang, Boomerang 2 and the 4th of July on it. Um, all expense spared, you know, none of the photographs, etc. that you're only on the vinyl edition, but for a long period of time until the release of the best of albums with the bonus discs and the deluxe editions of the albums with the extra tracks. The only place to get digital CD versions of a lot of U2 songs was on these CD singles. Uh, right, so, talking about The Unforgettable Fire. Um, in 2019, by the way, uh, a uh, deluxe version of the, the 2009 remaster uh, was pressed on, uh, I think it was a, uh, Burgundy vinyl, um, which is a nice way of saying red wine vinyl, which is the same colour as the, the dominant one on there. Um, this version in the UK was only sold from HMV. Uh, I queued up outside the HMV in Canterbury at stupid o'clock in order to get one. I'm not convinced it was worth it, but it's a YouTube album on coloured vinyl. And I actually haven't bought a new copy of The Unforgettable Fire. I bought one new copy of The Unforgettable Fire in my life, by the way. Uh, when I was building my record collection, I didn't have a huge amount of money, so I was buying second-hand vinyl LPs. So uh, this one was probably about £3.49 from Second City Sounds in around about 1988. Um, and the CD, I, I can't remember where I picked that up from. It's raining outside. I didn't expect that. So it's raining so loud I can hear it. Can you hear that? That's really weird. Anyway, here comes the uh, 2019 Burgundy Vinyl Red Wine Coloured Version of the album. And uh, in 2009, um, a deluxe edition of it was also issued, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, after that, though, uh, the band released their next single. Um, so they went on tour, and what they found is that they were, they were again, Playing live is the greatest advert for the band that there is. So they, they were really kind of capturing uh, their audience through playing live. Now, when, the, when they got to playing Australia, New Zealand, for example, the first time they played Australia and New Zealand, it was the first time that they'd, they'd played those countries full stop. So they were coming to Australia as a big band. They'd not done any of the gradual 
you know, uh, legwork of moving up from 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. They went straight in at 10,000 people in some of the arenas. I think in, I think it's in Melbourne or Sydney, they played to 30,000 people at their first show. Um, and they were a big band at that point. So it really kind of opened their eyes a little bit around what was coming around the corner. You know, there was a degree of probably in an audience of ten to 30,000 people with a degree of hysteria and excitement. But if you've been seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis, you haven't seen happen because you've been touring. And, you know, like for, for me, as I've moved through my career, there's never been a moment where suddenly I realised, oh, I've arrived. I'm, I am, you know, doing what I want to do, although I have days like that now. You don't suddenly get that realisation. You just gradually, through day-by-day, day, change uh, your work until it becomes the thing where you suddenly realise, yeah, I'm headlining an arena. I'm headlining a stadium, you know. And on the Unforgettable Fire Tour, they headlined uh, Madison Square Garden for the first time in 1985. They had their first Rolling Stone cover, um, so they were really becoming quite a big band indeed. And a huge chunk of that was on the back of the Pride single, which you know, uh, Quincy Jones calls songs like Pride, songs like I still haven't found what I'm looking for. He calls them house music. Uh, and the reason he calls them house music is because they make it so rich you can buy houses with those songs. Uh, very funny man. Very interesting way of looking at the world. Uh, so the band went out on tour, played lots and lots of live shows, uh, and they uh, recorded some some material, um, some some gigs in Birmingham and London with the idea of some live B sides for their next single. Um, their next single was the Unforgettable Fire. Here's a UK seven inch again. Not afraid to format it. There was a double seven inch single uh, which contained pictures of the band and photographs from TV screens, which was quite popular actually because the cover of a, a Eurythmics album, uh, I think it's Be Yourself Tonight, has that on there. And uh, let me just quickly check the cover here of that one. By the way, one of you has to have a, a tour of, the, uh, of what's on these shelves. You will get it at due course. So here's Eurythmics Be Yourself Tonight. Again, a photograph of the band, photograph off a television screen, which is exactly the same thing that happened on the cover of the Unforgettable Fire single. Um, but the Unforgettable Fire single was again formatted quite heavily. Uh, and when you listen to the Unforgettable Fire track, uh, by the way, um, if you listen carefully, you'll hear Larry drop the drumsticks and swear during the introduction to the Unforgettable Fire track. It goes tick, 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 and then he goes, Hack, I think. Um, and so here's the the seven inch single which is backed with a sort of homecoming produced by tony visconti so it's an alternate recording of uh, a sort an alternate arrangement of a sort of homecoming now i think this version of a sort of homecoming is the definitive version of the song um which it was recorded as a soundtrack sound check at wembley arena uh, in 1984 um, they then went into the studio uh, overdubbed some vocals maybe a bit of extra guitar um, and added in the audience uh, clapping along in time to this song um, on the B side. I just wish they kept the soundtrack, soundtrack version and not included the clapping because that would have been, in my opinion, the definitive take of the song. Um, I wish they'd play a sort of homecoming more often live. They played it about five or six times on the Joshua Tree Tour in 2017. Before that, I think it was twice in 2001, and before that was around about 1989. Great song. Uh, and at another episode, I will tell you about the time when I asked the band and uh, when Mark Peterborough asked the band to play a sort of homecoming live in Dublin, which seemed to make sense. Uh, but they chose not to. They chose to play bad instead. Um, it's a tough life when you look at seeing you two and you think, well, I got bad, but I didn't get a sort of homecoming. It's not really a disappointment. Now, this seven inch single by the way, the double seven inch of Unforgettable Fire uh, was backed with a couple of extra songs as well, not just a sort of homecoming, it was backed with uh, the three sunrises on here and on the B side it was also backed with Love Comes Tumbling and 60 Seconds in Kingdom Come. And 60 Seconds in Kingdom Come was only released on this double seven inch single for many, many years, so it was really difficult. If you wanted to hear that song, it was difficult to get, it was expensive and it was out of my price range for many, many years. So I loved you two, but I had to listen to a version version of it recorded on a cassette uh, and eventually at some point I mentioned now oh, I'm fed up of uh, listening to that I'm going to buy it myself so I bought it myself anyway the unforgettable fire comes in another uh, configuration for us this is your standard 12 inch single uh, which is again five tracks now the five tracks on here are not the same five tracks that are on the double seven inch uh, because it opens up with three sunrises so the, the the first song on the 12 inch is three sunrises then there's unforgettable fire there's the uh, version of um, 
sort of homecoming, which is recorded at Wembley in Good Earth Studios. Which has got uh, backing vocals on it by the edge. Then there's Love Comes Tumbling, which is on the double seven inch. And you've got Bass Trap, which isn't on anything else. So if you want to get all the songs, there are six songs released on this, this single. Uh, five of them are on here. You need to get the double seven inch as well. Um, presumably, so you could buy, they could sell more copies and they could prove to you that people still liked it. This is uh, a YouTube picture disc. This is a seven inch picture disc single that's shaped of the unforgettable fire. Um, the cover of it looks quite good, but if you look around the edge, very, very brown. And the reason it's very, very brown is because when the, the picture disc technology at the time wasn't that great. And so therefore, um, what you have is you have oxidisation where, where oxygen uh, would get into the single and um, it would, you know, as you see, become very, very brown indeed around the edge. It's my Ghostbuster shaped picture disc 7 inch, which is the first single I ever bought, is exactly the same. Uh, and as you look at it, it says U2 uh, on the back, the right way round. And on the front, it says to you. So to me, to you. Uh, but again, uh, it's got um, this side is The Unforgettable Fire, the uh, title track, uh, uh, which has all the copyright and label information on it. And this side is a sort of homecoming. Um, it's... The last picture disc that they released for a very long time, indeed. At least the last official picture disc that they released. Uh, I must admit, I saw a copy of this and I was like, you know what, I'm old enough now. I only need to get my permission when it comes to buying records and I authorise myself to buy it. It's one of the best things about being a grown-up. Uh, you know, the paying tax and working for a living bit, not so good. They're not needing anyone's permission to buy a record part of it. That's very good, indeed. Um, there's an interesting couple of releases which came around around about the time of the unforgettable fire single these are not going to be the ones that you think they are by the way um, the first one is is this now this is a, a real doozy uh, it is the uh, Australian CD single of uh, sorry no, the Australian 12 inch single of the unforgettable fire uh, but as you look at it they have spelt unforgettable incorrectly with one T and, and not only have they done that by the way that the uh, the 12 inch in here yeah, it has the standard, uh, starts with three sunrises, has unforgettable fire, has a sort of homecoming on it, love comes tumbling and bass trap. But it has, someone's picked, someone picked out the wrong tapes because the version of um, a sort of homecoming on here has a different set of backing vocals on it. So it's a different mix of the song um, that's not been reissued. Also, Love Comes Tumbling here, uh, they've pulled out an alternate take of Love Comes Tumbling. Bono sings different lyrics and different melodies. Uh, and again, that was a mistake. So that this version of the 12 inch, which has unforgettable spelt with one T, not more than one T, that's the dead giveaway to it, um, is really quite rare indeed and has two unreissued U2 performances on there. And the version of Love Comes Tumbling is clearly an early guy vocal. It's a bit rubbish but it's worth having. Uh, and you can really see that the version that's on the, the proper 12 inch single and the, set and, and the um, uh, CD single, uh, the ones which they want you to get. So just gonna bring out, here's again, the CD single of the Unforgettable Fire. It's built with two T's. Uh, and again, it's a five tracker starting with three sunrises and it has Love Comes Tumbling and Bass Trap on them for a very long time period of time. It was the only place to get Bass, bass trap on, on CD. Um, also around about this time, the next thing, and this is perhaps slightly more classic, is the Wide Awake in America uh, EP, which officially was not released in the UK uh, until I think around 2019. Um, effectively, 33 RPM, half live, half B-sides, uh, a special low-priced collection of live recordings and outtakes from the unforgettable Fire Tour and album 1984 to 1985. Now, some people are wondering, well, why isn't Love Comes Tumbling or The Three Sunrises on the album? They are better than some of the songs that are on the album themselves, and I can't disagree with that. I think that Love Comes Tumbling and The Three Sunrises were also recorded at Good Earth Studios, or at least they were, the, the final vocals and mixes were done at Good Earth Studios at the same time they were polishing off um, a sort of homecoming and uh, also uh, bad now bad is 
regarded as one of the best U2 live songs. And they're absolutely right to suggest so. And that's why it's the lead track on this 12-inch and uh, also on the relevant uh, CD, wherever I put it. Um, hmm. Oh, yeah, it's up there. Well, you just have to trust me when I say I've got the CD single, uh, because I have, and uh, I would have no... No reason to fib to you. Yes, I can see it, but if I have to go and go over and get it, I'll stand up and I'll leave the frame, and that's not going to be very exciting. So Why Do Make It America was released in America, and uh, U2's fierce live reputation preceded them at that point. So bad, when they played it live, um, it has a different intro. It has a, an extra two or three minutes at the end. So you listen to the studio version of that. There's, um, it ends uh, probably about two-thirds of the way through the live arrangement. And the intro to Bad has this arpeggio, um, which has not been released on a studio recording. Um, but it does appear on the album version of The Unforgettable Fire, but it's introduced in the middle of the second verse as a texture that comes in, but they use that to actually start the song. So if you only listen to the U2 albums, when they started playing Bad, you might be like, is this a new one? Um, and certainly for the, for the tour, it wasn't that familiar. But the song really evolved and changed. And so there's uh, the extra section at the end of the, the song. So when they play it live, um, that arpeggio fades out at the end of the section where it goes, I'm not sleeping. And um, it then becomes the band themselves. So that, that arpeggio ends at the end of the studio uh, arrangement of the song. There's an extra two or three minutes. Now, the longest version of Bad, by the way, is 17 minutes long and was recorded, I think, in Meadow Bank or New York or somewhere in 1985. And it had bits of Walk on the Wild Side in it and uh, loads and loads of other songs in there. Uh, but the longest version of Bad that exists, at least that's been released, is on the Unforgettable Fire 2009 reissue, uh, which I will, uh, well, it seems as good a time as ever to address it. So 25 years after the album came out, uh, the band um, picked up and reissued the Unforgettable Fire. So they'd started doing their, their reissues in 2007 with the 20th anniversary edition of The Joshua Tree, which is my next U2 episode, is talking about The Joshua Tree. Um, and then 2008, they reissued uh, Boy October War Under a Blood Red Sky. And Under a Blood Red Sky had a DVD in it, as mentioned in a previous episode. Thanks for, thanks for watching, viewers. 2009, they released the first of, of these, which is a, a more expansive, weighty box set version of The Unforgettable Fire. So let's have a look through, through what's on here. So looking at the back here, we've got you know, Disappearing Act, which is previously unreleased. Uh, we've got all of the B-sides, sort of homecoming, bad love comes tumbling, the three sunrises. We've got an extra track called Yoshino Blossom, uh, which hasn't come out before. We've got a remix of Wire, Boomerang One. We've got probably a long version of Pride. We've got a remix of a sort of homecoming by Daniel Lanois. Uh, we've got 11 o'clock TikTok from the 12 inch of, t of, uh, of Pride. We've got a remix of, of Wire, the Celtic dub mix. We've got Bass Trap. Uh, Boomerang 2, an alternate version of 4th of July and 60 Seconds in Kingdom Come. So aside from the fact that it's not sequenced in a way that particularly is easy on the ears, you know, that's that's pretty much everything. Uh, you haven't got the alternate vocal of Love Comes Tumbling. You haven't got the alternate mix of um, a sort of homecoming. And you've also got a DVD which has uh, four videos on it. And it's got the making of the Unforgettable Fire documentary, which is 25 minutes of the band recording the album. Um, there's uh, excerpts from the U2's Conspiracy of Hope concert, U2 at Live Aid, which is Sunday Bloody Sunday, and Bad. And you've got two extra versions. You've got uh, an extra video of, of Pride, and you've got a bootleg version of 11 o'clock TikTok recorded, I think, at, uh, I think it's Croke Park. Although I inevitably have pronounced that incorrectly. Uh, and as I've mentioned previously, somebody will mention it to me that I've done so. Um, so let's go through the extra tracks that are on here. Uh, Disappearing Act is a, is a previously unreleased song from their period. Uh, but as you'll find with a lot of the U2 reissues is that Bono of 2008 or 2018 will go back and, and re-sing the vocal over the original studio recording. And his voice has changed over time. Uh, and if you want to see how his voice has changed, listen to the way that he sings Tonight, Thank God It's Them Instead of You on the do you know it uh, do they know it's christmas from 1985 from 1989 and i think there's a version from around 2008 or something of it um 
and his voice it has a different range and a different sound as he gets older through time. Um, also, that is the uh, only easily available vocal performance by Bono that I don't have, on the grounds that I think it's a ridiculously bad line to have in a song, is tonight we're going to thank God that we're not starving and that other people are. It seems tone deaf. And not only that, Paul Weller rhymed to it on top of the pops, and frankly, it was just... Yeah. No, not for me at all. So I don't have Do They Know It's Christmas. But what you can see is that Bono's voice changes over time. Every singer's voice changes over time as their body changes, their throats change. And, you know, you listen to later period David Gilmore, later period Lemmy. Sound very different from early years, from the early years. Very, very definitely. You know, um, Dave Garn's got a certain kind of thing in his voice now. Which he never had. Oh, me. When he started off, as I mentioned earlier, I am cutting down on the caffeine and today is a Saturday, so I don't have to be at work. So let's go through the box set whilst we're at it. OK, so it's very nice. It's a, a burgundy package. Um, there's a book that goes with it. Ooh, let's have a look at the book. So this is uh, the, the hardback book with photos of the band from the album sessions. And uh, some of these photos will become more familiar as we go along. There's also, I think, probably a... Uh, a set in here that's got some art cards in there so there's a album cover back of the album cover another photo another photo what the hell were you thinking wearing some of those hats uh, and that's them at um oh i can't remember the names and there's some cliffs uh they do make a, those cliffs make a very brief appearance in some of the concept art for some of the star wars movies as well uh, maybe Bono is ashamed of his hair, uh, the hair that launched the Thousand Footballers in 1985. So rocking the Kevin Keegan, uh, each of the discs here. So here's a gatefold uh, version of the Unforgettable Fire album itself. Here's a, a gatefold bonus disc with the uh, the extra recordings on. Um, and this is the, the DVD. Uh, we've got Cliffs of, I think, Mahia, I think they're called. Uh, sounds like something out of Game of Thrones. That's there, and that was a uh, an interesting watch, um, but not absolutely essential. Um, but the the unforgettable fire collection on this DVD replicates the unforgettable fire collection VHS with some extra uh, bits and bobs in it. Uh, probably deleted now. No idea if that's the case. Uh, I'm not necessarily paying attention, but that's the unforgettable fire 2009 edition. So what else were the band up to at this point? Well. Their record label in Ireland uh, was very good at releasing a thing called uh, called uh, three, four packs. So they did a four pack single set. Um, let's work out, make sure. So they've got the numbers on very, very clearly. Disc one, disc two, disc three, and disc four. Um, and these were were effectively ways of repackaging and selling the singles and the b-sides so somewhat strangely if you bought this the first track was pride and it was backed with fourth of july uh, again the alternate version of fourth of july uh, then we've got love comes tumbling and uh the three uh, and then then 30 seconds in kingdom come sorry 60 seconds in kingdom come and then we've got the three sunrises so trying to buy these all together as a four pack is quite expensive it's taken me a number of years to buy odd little one-offs because it's only been one part of the four so i was able to get them very affordably uh this one is uh sunday bloody sunday and two hearts beat as one in case you will fancy buying some u2 singles but you didn't actually have those songs extra bit of bait there and finally a seven inch single of boomerang one and boomerang two and these are different cuttings than the versions that are used on the the, the singles um again the other singles were also released uh there were a couple of other four packs that were released in about 981 of the first four singles from boy and then maybe the four singles from october and the period around it i'm not quite sure also this unusual little beastie uh is uh, an nme seven inch the enemy readers poll winners uh, seven inch single that came free it says given free with the enemy in may 1985 now uh it starts with bronski beat probably the band that have aged the least well out of the four that are on this disc uh, it's got a remix or a new recording of uh, ivo by the cocktail twins um Track three is The Smiths, What She Said, which is uh, live at uh, Oxford Apollo. 
and then track four is a, a the dub mix of Wire, uh, which was produced by Brian Eno and Daniel Lenoir, which is also on the the the, um, the reissue here. So the band really wanted a sort of homecoming, by the way, as a single. Um, and, and they also were interested in making Wire a single, so they did a couple of remixes of Wire. One is the Celtic dub mix that's on here, uh, and one is the Kavakian vocal remix, which is also on here. Um, they also did, uh, I think there's a, a remix of a sort of Homecoming as well, so they tried lots of different arrangements to make a sort of Homecoming a single, but it didn't quite work, so they used the live version as the B-side, effectively turning the Unforgettable Fire uh, into a almost a double, a double A-side. And that kind of brings us up to the almost the end of that period there's still a little way left to go so the band were touring fairly constantly uh this here is a, a cd and dvd box set forget the terrible cover art and the terrible footballer's hair on here um but this contains uh probably the the best quality live material circulating from the era so cd1 is uh and, and part of CD2 is a uh, full show from Nantes in France on uh, in October. And by the way, the band cancelled the first 11 dates of the European tour in 1984 so they could work through the live arrangements and make them uh, better and work after they, they tried and failed on the Australian shows. Uh, it's got a, a second concert from Bologna, which is an audience recording. Um, it's got a show at the Atlanta Omni in 1986 on the Conspiracy of Hope tour, which is about half an hour long and has... Uh, I think 12 uh, has has maybe six or seven songs on it. Um, and also then on the CD, we have uh, effectively three extra appearances here. So this has got a 48 minute live show from Dortmund, which was on German television, uh, which is the best quality circulating live footage from that tour. Um, it's got a TV appearance on uh, Dublin's uh, RTE2 in January, performing Woman Fish, a very early version of Trip Through Your Wires and Knocking on Heaven's Door. The band wish they hadn't made that appearance. Uh, they are really, really drunk. And um, Woman Fish was the first live performance of that song, the only live performance of that song, and it's not a great performance. Um, and Trip Through Your Wires is really uh, embryonic as well. It still needs a lot of work before it becomes the beastie that turns up on the Joshua Tree album. And then the last part of it is the Dublin Island self-aid show at the RDS Arena that was on television uh, that features six songs, uh, including a, a kind of like a guest appearance on Whiskey in the Jar with all the people at the end of the show. Um, probably quite difficult to get hold of this, but the live stuff is on YouTube and the um, the, the live recordings from Nantes are available from, from various trading websites on the internet. Uh, in fact, you can just Google it, YouTube, if you want to hear it, and you want to hear a full, full-length, unforgettable fire live show. Um, also, around about this time, uh, Bono appeared as guest vocal on Planets in a Lifetime. I have no recollection of this song whatsoever, uh, but yeah, I did buy it, presumably on the grounds that I would listen to it and I would like it more once I'd listened to it, and I don't have an opinion about it. Now, the band were up to a little bit more than that at the time. Uh, around about 1986, uh, we also saw what is to date the only solo album by a member of U2. And, and that is a soundtrack to a film called Captive, when The Edge does the soundtrack for this. Um, Larry Mullen plays drums on uh, a song or two. He plays drums on um, Heroin, which is the title track and used over the credits. And uh, Sinead O'Connor makes one of her first ever appearances on it as well. It's... Uh, uh, it's a really interesting album. It's kind of like if you want, if you if you like the stuff from Sixty Seconds in Kingdom Come, uh, and some of the other material, it's basically a full instrumental album by Edge with Larry Mullen playing drums on one of the songs. Uh, really interesting. If you like the textures that you've got around the you know the the Brian Eno and Daniel Lenoir era, era tracks, songs like Fourth of July, and so on and so forth well worth getting, uh, available on CD. I don't think it's been reissued, but it is a special compact price. Uh, there you go. So God knows how much that sells for, probably 50p. Uh, it was also a single, which is here. Uh, I think it was released as a 7-inch and a 12-inch. I've got the 7-inch because I've got too many records, and it's got a remix of Heroin on the B-side in there, Sinead O'Connor's appearance as well. Uh, she's got an incredible voice, as you know. Um, 
and it's a it's a it's a great song. It's a hidden classic of the of the era. Uh, and if you wanted to hear, you know, Larry and Edge and Sinead O'Connor doing a single in 1986, well worth listening to this. Um, and no doubt you can find the album on YouTube, so you can listen to that as well. Uh, a couple of other bits and bobs. Um, we've got this book here, which is Stealing Hearts from a Travelling Show. Uh, a Stealing Hearts at a Travelling Show, which is a, a, a book of artwork of U2, um, which I will be touching upon in more detail. Uh, the band also published this, the U2 Portfolio, which is the official U2 songbook from the period that has lyrics, tablature, and uh, yeah, photographs from the era. Uh, Hot Press magazine, never want to miss a chance, took this photo. Hmm, that looks oddly familiar to this one, doesn't it? Uh, and did a kind of like a compilation of uh, reprints of, of old articles and things like that. Now, what we will find actually is uh, Live Aid, which is on here. Very, very important show for the band. Um, and, and Bono really thought that they'd screwed it up because the version of Bad that's on here is about 13 minutes long, of which probably about six minutes, although it feels like six years, is Bono walking around in the crowd and taking a woman out of the crowd. And that was the bit that actually Bono thought he'd massively screwed up because they were due to play Sunday, Bloody Sunday, Bad and Pride. They only ended up playing Sunday, Bloody Sunday and Bad. Um, but... It was a moment that actually most people found really, really inspirational. And I'm going to quote from, from, from this book, U2 by U2, um, which is that uh, Bono was really miserable about that. He thought he'd really screwed up his biggest TV appearance ever. Um, and he, he went home to uh, his uh, his wife's mother and father, who lived in Wexford, uh, uh, and he met a sculptor called Seamus Furlong. Um, and he was working on a piece which was a man that was in mid-air. Uh, and he asked him, well, what's that? And you know, Seamus said, well, it's called The Leap. And he went, it's The Leap, The Leap of Faith. That's you. And he was like, what? And he said, no, that is you. What are you talking about? He said, we saw you at Live Aid. You did a leap. You remember when you went into the crowd? And he went, oh, yeah, I remember that. I, I thought a little else for the past couple of days. And he said, you were getting out of your skin. You weren't happy on the stage. You wanted something more. You made a leap of faith. You got something. You touched it. And I did this because I was inspired to, you know, and that's something which I think really kind of bolsters uh, Bono into realizing that he hadn't just screwed up the entire band's career by doing that. He, he transcended, you know, the, the art of a man singing to a crowd, but actually became part of the crowd itself. And this is something which, you know, even now there's a connection between that particular anecdote and the line in Beautiful Day when Bono sings, touch me, take me to the other place. He's talking about making that leap of faith, you know, reaching a higher plane of... Um, comprehension understanding emotion that you can create through art and i use art to help me access my feelings and the way in which i see the world and presumably the leap of faith did exactly the same thing now that's that's probably the best place to end for now next stop is the joshua tree i'm going to do some episodes about uh, star wars before that um might even pick up another band or two. I'm not sure. Probably at some point I'm going to end up talking about every band in my collection. And there'll be 4,000 episodes of these that nobody will ever watch. Um, but uh, as ever, if you've got questions, if you've got comments, put them under the line, save them to me on Twitter. Um, I do read them all and uh, I will address some of them. I will give you the tour of what's on these shelves at some point in a future episode. Uh, possibly record by record, depending on how boring I need to be. Uh, but for the meantime, obviously... Uh, London and the South East, which is the part of the world that I live in, despite my accent telling you otherwise, has gone into Tier 4. All non-essential shops have shut, or pubs have shut. There is nothing going on. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just sat here with lots of time and lots of opinions. Um, now thank you very much for watching this. Um, I have an alternate track listing that I've put together for the uh, Unforgettable Fire album. I will put it in the comments section uh, underneath here. Um, I think maybe probably the biggest criticism I can make of the Unforgettable Fire is that it's poorly sequenced, in my opinion. It doesn't have a you know the ebb and flow and the crescendo, which I, I like to have in albums. Uh, and yes, I think maybe Love Comes Tumbling and the Three Sunrises should be on the album. Um, you know, there's a song like Promenade that's on the album, which is the sound of two members playing separate parts without being able to hear each other at the same time in different rooms that was recorded together. Uh, what I will say is I think the Unforgettable Fire is in my top six or seven U2 albums. I think it's their best album of the 80s. It's the, the most ambitious, artistic, uh, mysterious record that they made in that decade. 
um, and it, it captures an, an air, a moment in, in history which no other U2 album has really had, which is of young, ambitious men feeling their way towards you know, greatness and perhaps sometimes even achieving it without necessarily having an eye on necessarily having to be famous and to sell tickets and to headline stadiums. Um, it's a really important record in the U2 career. Um, hopefully you like it. Uh, there's a heck of a lot more to it than Pride. It's a dense album um, and, it, and it rewards repeated listening. Uh, and hopefully you will find it as good as I do. And in the now, at this point, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to have a drink and I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to eat some chocolate brownies. Thank you very much. Uh, see you all soon for the next episode, which I think is episode 32 if you come back. Okay. Love you lots. Well, sort of lots. And see you soon. Bye.